And welcome to Small Biz Matters again for this week with Alexi Boyd here in the Triple H 100.1 FM studios and live across Australia on the Community Radio Network. Thanks for joining me, everybody, today. I'm very excited to be welcoming a very special guest, someone who uh, I guess we've known each other for a couple of years, got to know each other in terms of business, small business colleagues, and it's a fascinating story I'm really looking forward to sharing with you today. We're going to be talking all about small business marketing. Now, it's not a subject that I am a particular fan on on this show because I believe there's a lot of really great podcasts out there that do it very, very well. But it's something we should discuss on Small Business Matters and something that is very much a part of your small business education. And that's why I have got Edward Zia on the show today. Now, Edward is um, very well known in LinkedIn. He's uh, worked the system uh, very hard and he believes that it's very important as part of his strategy. He's going to be telling us a little bit about that strategizing today. But also what's interesting about Edward is his background noise, his small business journey, where he's come from, his upbringing, and a little bit about what got him here today. When we met a couple of years ago, I would perhaps put it out there and say that he wasn't as well known as he is today. So the last couple of years have been really um, testament to what he does. He's also very passionate about the small business community like us here on Small Biz Matters, and he's a big fan of events networking, collaboration and co-working spaces, which my regular listeners will also know that I'm a big fan of. So how is it that you go from being relatively unknown to one of the most connected, notorious (laughs) sales marketing gurus in Sydney? He's passionate, he's outspoken, and it takes time and perseverance to get to the top of your game. So I'd like to share with you his incredible journey today. Welcome to the program, Edward Zia. Thank you, Alexi, and thank you, Australia, and God bless your hearts. It's an absolute pleasure being here. Look, it's great to have you. We've we've known each other for a while. Um, let's start first of all with with your journey because I think this is a really interesting one. It's great to learn from other people's experiences. Tell us how you got from your past experiences in work and in life to where you are today. It's a great question, Alexi. And I was actually uh, discussing this the other day, and it's been very interesting. And uh, truth be told, when I was nineteen, I actually joined the army. So a very very long time ago, I uh, left my beautiful uh, suburb in Melbourne and I uh, went off to join the army, and it was incredible. And I've had an incredible eclectic life that's led me to this point. And in summary, for the sake of uh, this glorious radio show. It pretty much started with me being in the army. Uh, I was seconded to by the spe- I was seconded by the special people in Canberra. I uh, did some great special task forces of the Australian government. I got injured very badly. Whoever thought busting drug dealers would be dangerous? It turns out it is, <laughs> right? And uh, so I got injured very badly. That was all, almost the end of me. And that led me in a different direction in life. I originally had this whole policing military thing. I was uh, in my 20s deciding whether I should stay in the AFP and go in that direction or whether I should go to Duntroon and become an army officer. And for me, it went in a totally different direction. I ended up becoming a corporate, moving into marketing. I did my postgraduate marketing in life. And long story short, I um, made a few mistakes when I was a little bit older, just before my 30th, and I wound up living in my car, um, actually in debt. What a smart move that was, Alexi. So you've you've actually gone from being within the army and sort of, I guess, in that nurtured environment, which is quite well supported. Yes, did you have the wool taken out, the rug taken out from underneath you? Is that how you ended up sleeping rough? Well, the actual answer is uh, it was actually my fault. Uh, so what it was is that actually, ironically, after the army, um, I actually had a very successful career. I even made it up to a marketing director at Rest Point Casino in Hobart. So I actually had a very successful career. But what it was is a lot of my you know injuries and I had PTSD at the time. A lot of that caught up with me, and I made some very very poor decisions with money and relationships, and. I ended up uh, celebrating my 30th in my car, right? I was a, I was a homeless veteran, right, at the age of uh, 29, 30. And for me, what was very interesting about that was I actually wasn't angry because I kind of was intelligent enough to work out how, why I put myself there. Mm. And so I came to Sydney, start my life again. Um, I used to live... I always used to say I used to be a homeless person in style. I used to live on the beautiful DY beach. <laughs> you on the beach, literally. So I was homeless in style. Yeah, yeah. But DY is a great suburb. Did you? I mean, I can imagine with a personality such as yours, you would have literally woken up one morning and go, "You know what? I'm done. We're gonna we're gonna fix this up. We're gonna sort this out. We're, I'm gonna I'm gonna put my, my hat back on and we're gonna get back on with things." Um, but did you have support mechanisms in place? Um, where was your family at the time? What, what was what was happening there? Did you have some psycho psychological support as well or were you literally just pulling yourself up from your bootstraps again? A complete bootstrap. So I had nothing, right? And 
and I kind of deserve my situation because um, in my twenties I used to I used to be a bit of a mean person at times, and it I actually felt like what happened to me was very just, and it was a chance for me to really reflect on and uh, look at my life. And what I really learnt from that is it wasn't so much a split moment of me changing my wicked ways. It was more me thinking things through. Mm. And over a period of a few years, so it was over a period of a few years, eventually found some employment. Uh, and that sort of helped me, you know, actually sort of reintegrate into normal civilization. And then I thought, what do I want to do with my life? And I thought, I kind of love coaching. Mm. I kind of love marketing. Well, I can you become love a marketing coach. You love talking to people. You love, you love hearing about people's stories. And I think that's one of your strengths. And something we're going to be talking a little bit about later in the show and how to, how to tap into those strengths yeah. to build yourself back up again. Exactly. So you enjoy speaking to people. You enjoy hearing about their journeys and where they've come and, and, they, and they bring them through. Let's, let's cut for, fast forward to your, um, your meetup groups because we've had other people on the show talk about meetup. But why do you think that is strategically in terms of a sales and marketing point of view so important to make that part of your your philosophy or your um, strategy when you're growing a business. Oh, absolutely. And uh, Meetup is great. And in full disclosure, I actually am part of WeWork and Meetup and I help run Meetup across Sydney mm. and I support Meetup organisers across Australia. Mm. So Meetup to me, uh, way before I got any official roles of Meetup, I was actually quite successful on Meetup already in running my own regular marketing meetups in Sydney. So basically there will be weekly fortnightly events uh, called Profitable Marketing Meetup. And what it is, we just come together and I just share ideas with people, inspire people, have really good networking exercise and bring people together. And what was interesting was that originally, to give it some context, my business used to be very touch and go and it was actually New South Wales Business Chamber that Mm. helped me become stable. It was then Meetup that allowed me to really take off, right? Really, really take off and thrive because what would then happen is that every fortnight I'd been up in front of 50 people. Yeah. And just those numbers, when you crank out those numbers, when you're up in front of 100 people a month, it just added up and added up. You only need one or two people to say, yeah, I'll be a client, and that everything just works out. So do you think that that's where, um, if you're strategizing and you're thinking, oh, okay, I'm going to the opening of an envelope and I'm starting to head to these events locally and these events Mm. more Sydney-based and in my capital city, um, is that where you need to start being a bit more careful about what you do? Or or are you one of those, you should just go to the opening of an envelope approach for the first couple of years just to get out there and get well-known? What? What's your opinion on that? Well, I I am um, calling out my own errors and just being um, honest, uh, intellectually honest with everyone is I used to be the opening to an envelope guy mm. uh, and I did that for about two, three years and things weren't quite working out for me. And then what I did was that's when I originally discovered the amazing New South Wales Business Chamber mm-hmm. and that's where things really started to actually come together for me. But is that because they were a platform to do more networking or because a a chamber like that provides the nurturing, caring and supportive environment that you needed? Oh, yes to all the above. Right. So I suppose, um, and I say this about all business chambers, I say this about New South Wales Business Chamber, Uh, the business chambers to me gave me three things. It gave me access to the right people, people with money, people who are successful, people that would become my clients. Secondly, it gave me exactly what you just said, Alexi, the nurturing and the exposure and support. And thirdly, what it gave me was the inspiration because I was surrounded by such successful people, as you said before, it lifted me by, by my bootstraps. So for example, I'll use this as a very superficial way of explaining a deeper point. Um, right now, I'm really handsome and good looking and I've been working out. Not superficial at yeah. all. But I'm allowed to say that because... It's I radio. Used, <laughs> no one can see you. I used to be so <laughs> fat. So I used to be... Um, so I've lost about 20 kilos over the past... Uh, the three, small child. You oh, lost a small child. I, I, was, I was huge. I, I was huge. I was massive. <laughs> I was fat. And what happened to me was um, basically being surrounded by all these, all these incredible people helped me really look in the mirror and mm. improve myself. And um, yeah, it's been great. Okay, so it's it's almost like being in one of those supportive chambers or, or business structures means that they're kind of helping you through some personal things as well, I guess. In a, a very indirect way. It wasn't so much I was part of this little group where we're all giving each other therapy. <laughs> uh, in, fact, in a circle. <laughs> yeah, in fact, on a funny note, on Meetup in America, uh, there's this uh, man-hugging group that's come out where all men meet up and hug each other. So really? it wasn't, yeah, it's quite cool. It wasn't quite like that. It wasn't exactly like we all hug each other. Yeah. But what it was more like and what it was more about was that um, it was – more just being surrounded by so many successful people, it washes off on you, mm. right? Because originally when I rocked up at New South Wales Business Chamber, um, I felt like the guy with the potato sack, mm. right? So everyone's in business suits and, and I was like in the potato sack. 
now now I look like one of the top now I'm one of the top players there. So it's been interesting when you walk into a high performing environment, it just naturally changes you. You you either adapt and win or you move on. Mm. I, I I pick the former, not the latter. Question: How do you, as a startup, not startup, but really just getting startup's started good. with what you're yeah, doing? Yeah, good. Good. how do you not become completely intimidated by a room like that? What's your tips for someone walking in and not feeling as though they're a small fish in a big pond? Yeah. Well, I was completely intimidated and terrified. <laughs> right? um, and this is where, and I say this, but how uh, do you not turn on your heel and just leave? Well, I, this is where you have to grow a bit of a spine, mm. right? And this is to me. This is actually one of the reasons why I got in a lot of trouble. One of the reasons why my original... One of the key things that made me homeless was having a lack of spine, right? And I kind of realised um, how I got myself in a... Yeah, you know, how I lost everything and I was, you know, living it rough. And I really could see that, yeah, okay, I need to grow a bit of a spine here. I need to, um, I need to really strengthen up here to become very successful and thrive. And... What I did was, regardless of how uncomfortable it made me, I just stayed in that environment and mm. naturally I then stepped up to the environment. Now it's the other way around. Now I'm the guy making people at ease and I'm now, I'm like, I'm part of the team, you know. So it's funny how, and I'll say this to anyone starting out, you'd be surprised that in a few years the tables can turn very quickly. Is, is it, is it clicky and you just need to become part of the click or... You need to embrace the environment that you're stepping into. Yeah, I would say, and just being honest, New South Wales Business Chamber is not clicky at all. That's mm-hmm. one of the reasons why I like it. However, and this is however, you kind of have to look the part. Yeah. So when I arrived, I did not look the part, right? But I figured out very, very, very I figured out very quickly, oh, I could actually make it here. But I'm going to need to change and change that I did. Mm, literally out of the clothes you were wearing. Yeah. So a, a bit of a plug there for those of you out there who are stylists. Uh, the stylist industry, I think, has got um, a really good opportunity here because people are trying to make more genuine connections, yeah. more face-to-face networking. Um, hire someone to get yourself a whole wardrobe and and, uh, and get, get looking good, basically. Yeah, and I've actually had um, a few really good stylists really help me out. One person I actually want to give a shout-out to is a very, very good friend of mine by the name of Anne Vodica. Mm-hmm. Uh, she's a very, very um, ex Qantas, right? Very brilliant, uh, friendly, attractive lady. And she gave she actually spoke at one of my meetups recently. And she gave me some incredible tips uh, going back about a year or so that really helped me sort of look the part today. And it's funny that, um, and I really do believe this. And you, you learn this in the army as well. You can have a bunch of people literally, literally off a bus arrive for military training. And the moment you whack them in an army uniform, they all of a sudden become different people. Yeah. So whilst you could say, oh, clothes are just superficial and this, this and that, well, not quite because when you change someone's clothes, it starts to actually really, you know, have deep internal uh, changes to that person's psyche. And, and, you know, it's an important person thing to note when you're thinking about going out and doing the networking thing. Think, mm. about, think about what you're wearing. Mm. Now, let's talk about um, entrepreneurship. It's another aspect of small business that you're very passionate about. Yes. Um, you take a lot of entrepreneurs under your wing. Now, now take me through what is it that makes an entrepreneur? What's definition-wise in your eyes? Is it because you are starting something new and fresh and completely different? Or is it simply because you're a certain age? Or is it because you've only just started in business? What, in your mind, makes an entrepreneur? Well, it's an interesting question, and um, I don't think there's a straight answer to it. I think there's a very fluidic answer, right? It's like, you know, what is feminism, right? It's about, you know, <laughs> um, you know what is democracy, yeah, you know? Yeah. Um, it's, it's one of those big questions. But I'll give you this answer for a movie I want to give a shout-out to. Uh, my wife and I, um, and she, it was her idea. It was great for me. We watched The Founder which was about Ray Kroc starting McDonald's, oh. right? And highly recommended. It's starring Michael Keaton. I'm a big Michael Keaton fan. I'm a man of the 90s, so I love Michael <laughs> Keaton, right? I'm Batman. Um, <laughs> but so I'm a man of the 90s. But what it, to me, the film The Founder perfectly describes what an entrepreneur is because it sort of documents Ray Kroc's journey in starting McDonald's, mm. right? And to me, one of the key traits that makes an entrepreneur, it's someone who creates something brand new, mm. but an entrepreneur is also someone who really puts themselves on the line, Right, because me included, every entrepreneur I know has put themselves on the line at some point, be it emotionally, be it psychologically, uh, be it financially. You yeah. know, you know, I've you know a lot of people who wrap their houses around a mortgage to keep their business going. Mm. Right, lose their business, they lose everything. And it's about the time that you invest as well, and the passion that you have behind it. So I like I like your uh, definition there. It's being fluid, the yeah. fact that it's not anything specific. 
So you're stepping into the Sydney, let's say the Sydney marketing scene, and you yes. and I have had discussions about the the regional nature of the outer suburbs oh, yeah. of Sydney versus yeah. um, the inner suburbs. So why do you think it's so important that once people have explored all of the potential clients or connections that you can make externally from Sydney, why is that that Sydney hub so important to get your fingers into? Why why is that? Is it just numbers? No, it's it, it's part of it, but that's not it. Um, so the thing that happened to me was that uh, I live in Parramatta, which is in Western Sydney. Uh, I'm very proud of Western Sydney. Uh, however, not everyone is as proud of Western Sydney as I am, <laughs> right? Uh, and this is the thing about Sydney. Now, I love Sydney. It's the you know, and this is coming. I'm a I'm an ex Melburnian, and I defected and joined Sydney. And the thing with Sydney, Sydney's a wonderful place. This is what I say to a lot of people to explain Sydney. In Sydney. I don't think anyone's racist or sexist. I've never really experienced it like other places in the world. But you honestly get a lot of classism going on, mm. right? And a lot of way classism is expressed is what school did you go to? What part of town that you're from? So to me, one of the things from Sydney that is a problem is classism. And where it gets tragically expressed is where are you from? And then people always ask that in Sydney. And usually people will then make mental judgments about where someone's from. So if I said to someone I'm from Parramatta, it's not as bad. Parramatta's actually got a good reputation now, but if I said that 10 years ago, I'd be, whoa, really? It's like you have this negative tinge to it. So to me, what was very important is by positioning my business in the city and spending more time in the city, it repositioned me and it made me appear to be more of a leader across town. Whereas when I was trying to do things from Parramatta, it just didn't quite work. People just thought I was some guy from Parramatta. Mm. The moment I moved to Sydney, it sort of made me compatible with everywhere. And this is one of the things from Sydney. Whenever you say, I'm from this part of town, you kind of bias yourself to people from that part of town. But when you're based in, this, in the CBD, it kind of makes you universal. Mm. So be it someone from the eastern suburbs, the west, the northern sector where we are now, or even the shire, which is in the south. It's more of a compatible position. So it was more that image and positioning and the connections that helped change everything for me for the better. So when you start something, you would suggest, um, do you practice in the outer suburbs, sir? Say you're setting up a, 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 a sort of a, I guess, a workshop or a, some sort of a no, group or a network. You just start You back, just charge bang. right in there. Yeah. You just charge right in there. And it's not as though... I think what's interesting is that I, I've now that I'm sort of delving further down south, <laughs> it's not as though it's a flooded market. It still feels as though there's a lot of opportunities there for meets yeah. and greets and different types of networking because yeah. just it's a real buzz. Yeah. If I can just make one point, though, and um, just um, so no one misunderstands where I'm coming from, I'm absolutely not saying don't work your own area. Absolutely not saying that. Right. Um, I just want to make my point clear on this one is what I'm saying is, is that, again, I love Parramatta. I'm very proud of Parramatta. I've done a lot of work for the local community. Um, you know, I'm part of the Liberal Party. I've really helped out my local MP. What I always say to people, though, is be proud of whatever part of town you're from. However, you need to have some kind of city presence as well. Mm. So whether you're from Hornsby, which is where we are now, you're from Parramatta, you're from Liverpool, you're from Bondi Junction or you're from Cronulla, it's very good you have, or the Central Coast, it's very good that you have also a foot in the city mm. to give you that image. So you have that mixture of you're the big city character plus you're part of your local community, wherever that may be. Fantastic top tips there on uh, how to geographically position yourself. Yes. <laughs> now, when we come back after the break, we're going to talk a little bit about different ways of positioning yourself online from the sales and marketing guru, Edward Zia. Thank you for joining us on Triple H 100.1 FM. We will be back after this short break. <laughs> so um, we are talking today to Edward Zia, who, if you are on LinkedIn, you can't possibly not have come across. He's very present. He's a very much a, a big user of LinkedIn. And just before the break, we were talking about his journey, his small business, uh, pulling up from the bootstraps, coming from what is probably a pretty low point in life, bringing himself up to where he is today and the last couple of years of that journey. And part of that has been networking, entrepreneurship, getting to know other people and delving into different areas of Sydney. Don't forget people if you've missed any of today's podcast you can catch up via itunes and uh, also via smallbizmatters.com.au so let's talk a little bit now about a concept that you're quite passionate about Let me bring it back on my screen Se self-actualization after mm -hmm. survival yes so um tell me about this concept and uh why is it important for you in in your journey and and how you like to educate others Oh, very good. I'm actually going to refer a lot back to uh, my original uh, post-grader management that I did through the Australian Institute of Management many years ago. 
And one of the key concepts I learned was the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So I encourage anyone to Google it. And basically in Maslow's hierarchy of needs, what it talks about is what humans' needs are for survival and what generally motivates them. And it was a pyramid uh, from memory. And basically at the bottom of the pyramid, it's very functional. It's in terms of like, you know, food, water, shelter. Uh, then later on, it moves to like more emotional needs like companionship, you know, sex, those type of uh, things. Then as you work up the pyramid, basically it works like this. As humans' basic needs are met, like mm. the basic needs that civilization provides, humans then enter this need for self actualization And that's where people need to become who they really need to become. And I'll use a dark example to illustrate the opposite of self actualization You know how you get those rich Hollywood types that always go off the rails and do crazy stuff? <laughs> yeah. Right? They're an example of the darker side of Maslow's hierarchy needs in terms of they've got all the physical needs met in overabundance, but they haven't actually met their emotional needs correctly. So they go insane and they wind up on drugs and they do crazy stuff. And you see it all the time. Where on the other side of it, you'll see someone who's very, very poor that comes from meagre origins make it in whatever they're doing because they're actually doing what they really want. So self-actualization... If humans ultimately don't do what they really want, they tend to rebel and go crazy at some point. And you see this all the time where people divorce, uh, where people throw in long-time jobs, where um, yeah, basically their whole lives tip over. So it's very much what they want to do deep down coming true. So it, what you're saying that they really want to to go off the rails and they just want to go crazy. Well, quite often, you know, and I see this, I see this all the time, right? A very classic case. You see um, empty nesters, you know, uh, two people married, kids have left, and then they divorce, right? So I see this all the time, see it every week. And when you actually look at what's going on, right, it is, and again, you're not attached to any side. You're just looking objectively. Hmm. Quite often it's two people who haven't actually lived the lives that they've wanted, right? Um, and what actually happens in the situation is that when these people separate, they actually then start living their lives like they always wanted. Mm. They actually start doing whatever they want. You might have uh, you know, a lady get a much, uh, much more attractive man and become a yoga instructor, or a man goes off uh, with some young lady. You see this all the time, right? So how do you flip that around to the sexual... Sex, oops, the self-actualization. <laughs> this is community radio here. <laughs> the self-actualization yeah. of... Um, a small business owner. So obviously, I believe that small business is an evolution. We yes. move from one interest or something that we're passionate about to another. Um, we discover what our true abilities are and then we move into that space. Yeah. So how is that um, concept applicable to small business? Yeah, well, just um, continue on that point. Well, the way it works is, uh, Lexi, you know, into our wonderful and very attractive listeners, is that Self-actualization is making sure your business achieves what you want to do in your life. So the way we look at business, the way I look at it personally is your business is not you. Your business is a vehicle to help you achieve what you want in your life. And mm. I'll tell you now, the most successful, be it financially and emotionally, business owners that I know who are self-made, and believe me, I know lots of them, they're the ones that are doing what they're passionate about. Their business is their passion. Hence why they're really good at it. In fact, I don't know anyone who hates their business that's very successful. So if you're in business and you're not successful because of that reason, because you're not self-actualization, you're not, you're not in that space and you're not passionate yeah. about what it is that yeah. you do, where do you start? Do you go out and you meet a whole stack of new business people? Do you go and do some training, some retraining? But then where do you start with what you want to be? I mean, a lot of people, I think almost in the midlife crisis space, go, I'm really not enjoying what I'm doing anymore and I may be running my own business and I've flogged a dead horse for 20 years. Where do you begin to get that um, visualisation of where you should be heading? Absolutely. I think the first thing that people need to do in that situation, and I've actually been in that place in my own business a few years ago, right, and I restructured the business now, it's all working great. I think the first thing there is that if you are in business and it's just not working out for you emotionally, it's just you just don't like it, you just don't want to do you probably need to have some real serious, honest conversations with yourself. And one of my favourite things to do is actually get out of town and get away from the business and actually have some quiet time of, of reflection away from the internet. Right? Ooh, oh, well, there's an interesting concept. Get, get, off, get, get into off. your mind, get off the internet and into your own mind. And you've got to be honest with yourself, right? You've got to be honest with yourself. And I'll, and I'll, I'll say this, right? Let's say you've been in business for 20 years and you're not making much, I'll say this a lot, tragically, you're not making much money and you just hate what you're doing. You need to come clean. You need to sort of own up to the fact that this is not working out. 
So the first thing is coming clean, uh, that things aren't working out. And then taking some time out, going on a bit of a retreat and really looking into yourself to actually say, what went wrong? What do I want to do? Where do I actually want to go with my life? Mm. And when you start having that honest conversation with yourself, that paves the way for you to really figure out what you're passionate about. And there could be two things. You might have to close your business down and do something new. In my case, it wasn't closing my business down. It was tweaking my business and changing its structure. Mm. Right? Quite often, the good, and here's the good news, if you're listening to this and covered in sweat and freaking out, <laughs> right, and you're like, oh, God, it's calling me out. This is me. Uh, I'll say this to you. Uh, please, don't, please don't freak out totally. It might just, it might be you restructuring your business. Mm. It might, you might be doing the right thing, but your business isn't structured in a way that helps you live the life that you want. And when you say that, you might say, well, you might be saying, take, take those elements of your business you don't enjoy actually doing, the processes and procedures that are meaningless or, or not something that you want to do, outsource that. Or get someone employed in who can assist you and then go and do the things you're really passionate about. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I'll use an example of uh, one of my friends, uh, Scotty Schindler. Uh, he's uh, from the uh, central, uh, correction, he's from Coffs Harbour, which is, I suppose that's on the central coast, that's the northern coast. It's the say. central coast of Australia. Yeah, gotcha. <laughs> and, uh, and feel free to connect him with Scotty Schindler's a great guy. We, he actually, we actually met up in Sydney recently. He, was come, he came down and Scotty Schindler, I only met him recently, but we just clicked and Interesting when you look at Scotty Schindler's backstory. Uh, he was a successful manager and successful business owner and it didn't work out for him. He kind of retired, moved on from that. And he's now doing what he really, really wants. And I know a lot of people who've done that. I know a lot of very successful business people who actually either sold their businesses or moved on from their businesses. And that paved the way for them to do something brand new. And I'll make another throwback before. Before in this radio discussion, I mentioned the film The Founder, uh, which was the story of Ray Kroc uh, in the formation of McDonald's Corporation. What was interesting is that in the film, played by Michael Keaton, who did a great job. And what was interesting in that film was that it started off of Ray Kroc originally selling milkshake equipment, right? He was not really successful. He was just banking a living selling milkshake equipment. And he'd been doing that for years, but that paved the way for him to discover McDonald's and then create that new uh, global empire. So if someone says to me, look, Ed, I've wasted the past 20 years in my business, in my marriage, whatever. Okay, what's well, what we're going to do now that matters. Mm. It doesn't matter. Where it, some people self-actualize at the age of 10. Some people never do it. It's okay. When you do it is when you do it. And God bless. Uh, <laughs> whatever it is. Just do it well. Yeah. Look, we're going to take a quick break here on Triple H 100.1 FM. When we come back after the break, I want to talk to you about an expression I think you're famous for, which is feel free to connect with them. We're going to come back after this small announcements. And welcome back to Triple H 100.1 FM. You are live in the studio with Small Biz Matters with Alexi Boyd. And we have across the panel from us, Edward Zia, guru, sales and marketing expert, uh, but more importantly, and what I want to learn from you today at this point is all about LinkedIn. Can you give me some top tips? Because I think when you and I met, we met face to face, but give it a couple of years and I think it would have been much more likely that we would have met on LinkedIn. And there's an expression that you use, um, which can literally put a bomb underneath anybody's <laughs> LinkedIn profile, which is feel free to connect with them. Why do you think it's so important that people play whack-a-mole? With LinkedIn. Well, I think it's great because if you stand back and look at LinkedIn, and this is the way I describe LinkedIn to the community. LinkedIn to me, and not to me, but to a lot of people. Oh, by the way, we should also mention that Edward does not work for LinkedIn, and this is by no means a sell, but I don't know of any other platforms that really do what LinkedIn does, and it's such a crucial part of, of small business on, uh, like small business networking. Oh, it's critical. Mm. you got to remember uh, who owns LinkedIn. It's owned by Microsoft, right? Oh, so we're advertising the world's biggest company. Yeah, who yeah. is also, meanwhile, combating malaria. But we're, yeah, anyway, exactly, back, back. exactly. Yeah. So, in full disclosure, I am a massive advocate of Microsoft, and I do love Microsoft on many, many levels. So, in full disclosure, but no, with LinkedIn, LinkedIn is the ultimate business to business platform. In that, the way I describe LinkedIn is that LinkedIn is like a business chamber online, right? And what I really love about LinkedIn is that LinkedIn gives such an amazing opportunity for people to share content, share ideas and connect with each other. And what uh, Lexi, and just for the sake of our awesome and very attractive listeners, uh, was referring to before is that when you've got a bit of a following on LinkedIn, I actually crossed 18,000 followers the other day, which I'm really happy with. Ooh, congratulations. Taking, taking me long enough. And what's very important about it, and 
I'm really grateful to followers is that when you have that level of following, you can really highlight and help people. And one thing that's very important for what I do is I'm all about pulling people up, right? Mm. You know, social justice, equality, are core values that I hold. And I always love helping pull people up. So if I meet someone who is really giving it a crack and doing their best, the first thing I want to do is use my following to help highlight that person, okay? So what I did with, just for the sake of the audience, what I did to Alexi, which was really funny, was that Alexi and I caught up. We had a wonderful morning cup of coffee at the beautiful uh, Sofitel Wentworth in Sydney in the finance district. And then what it was is that we took a beautiful selfie and I said to everyone, you should connect with Alexi. And you got totally swamped. What I, happened I to you? I, I literally had to cancel a meeting to be able to deal <laughs> with the... <laughs> you should have given me a warning because I think this is the power of it, really, yeah. is that if you've got people who are well-connected and are passionate about connecting other people with one another, that simple phrase of, you should connect with her, um, I don't think it's necessarily people being a minion, but they see value in connectors and influencers by way of, well, this person could be actually quite valuable. Yes. Um, but I think what's important that you did as well, which is you explained who it is that they should connect with mm. first, not just here's a profile pic, this is a great person, away you go, which might have had the same effect. But importantly, when you're introducing people to one another, you give a bit of background and then, you know, you let, you let your connectivity work the system. And, and this is absolutely no benefit for you. And I think this is what's really lovely about the community and the online business chamber nature that you, you described it as. It's a real opportunity for, to help each other out. Yeah. as small businesses. And that's the thing that I point, and I was actually talking about this the other day with a very good friend of mine, uh, Wayne Donnelly, please connect with him. And we're talking about two types of leaders, right? And one, uh, whether you argue this is a leader or not, it's another discussion. But there are the leaders that control everyone and there are leaders that pull other people up. Now, I'm clearly in the latter club, right? Yeah, you're a puller. Yeah, I love, I, love, I, won't, I won't say I love pulling on <laughs> community radio, it sounds a bit weird, but I love... Uh, lifting people up. There yes, we go. That sounds lifting, better. Lifting, yeah, pulling people yeah, up sounded mm, a bit weird, yes. right? Uh, but I love helping lift people. Mm. And if I think back of the ultimate leaders and people I've worked with, actually reminds me of a very, very great man. When I was the marketing director at West Point Casino, I worked for a very, the general manager, a great man by the name of Mike Davey. He's on LinkedIn. Check him out. And he was the best boss I ever had. And he was all about lifting everyone up around him. He would, he would talk to a cleaner. He would talk to people on the floor. He was all about lifting everyone up. And he was just one of the most amazing inspirational managers I've ever encountered. And this is the big point, and this is to me what LinkedIn allows you to do. LinkedIn allows you to lift people up. And one of the big sayings that's very, uh, has come true in my life is give as gain. You will hear me say this time and time again, give as gain. The people that succeed, the people that do really well, are the ones who give more. And I'll use this as an example, a very tangible example. I know a lot of people across town. I know who's in vogue and I know people who's out of vogue. I know people who are loved and I know people who are hated. Very rare, the people that are successful, multimillionaires, self-made, are almost always loved people. They're loved by the community and they have their huge followers. You don't meet many mean people that are very successful. It usually doesn't happen. It makes sense. Because at the end of the day, let's say, let's say someone walks up to me and they need a solicitor for whatever reason. I'm going to refer them to someone I like, not someone I hate. Mm -hmm. Pure mm -hmm. and simple. Mm. So when you apply the paradigm of giver's gain, you lift people up, you naturally become successful because you're busy helping everyone. Oh, yeah, this is a funny saying. It's very hard to make enemies while you're trying to help people. True. Very true. If you're being like a mean person, you're going to line the enemies up. Mm -hmm. Right? So and it's interesting, actually. Some days on LinkedIn, I'll get seen by at, le at least 30,000 times. Right? Yeah, but I was going to ask you about that because um, is that not a kind of a blanket approach that can get a bit annoying? Because I know that I've spoken to other people who are very big on Twitter. Now, I don't do Twitter. I find it too exhausting. <laughs> Twitter. Twitter. I just, it's like this 24-7 kind of yeah. thing wrapping at your head. I just don't do it. I literally, I think I have a handle. Yeah. Uh, everyone feel free to follow me, but I do nothing Twitter's, on there. Twitter's funny. You want to know why it's funny? Well, it's because it's so immediate and it's reactionary. Yeah. And it's definitely not what I believe you're talking about, no, which is give us game. And yeah. it's all about just grandizing and yeah. soapboxing. Tw Twitter's an outrage machine. And I've I got a funny saying. Um, <laughs> outrage machine. This is one of my friends. Um, I, I won't say that they're from Microsoft, but it's one of my friends um, who is not from Microsoft. 
And we're actually talking about social media, and she's hilarious, right? And I actually asked her, saying, look, what did you, what's your views of the social media platforms? And this is the way she described all the platforms, and it was hilarious. She goes, well, LinkedIn is like a business association online. It's like, how do you do so? Good to meet you. Bravo. Good job. <laughs> Facebook is like a friend's barbecue on yeah. the weekend, right? Uh, Instagram is like taking photos of yourself topless in your bathroom. Uh-huh. And the way she described Twitter was hilarious. Twitter is either full of, um, quote, I quote here, is either full of right-wing Bible-thumping Trump supporters or transgender purple head so <laughs> there's, no, there's no way in between. Yeah, so there's nowhere in between. So yeah. if you're on Twitter as a normal person who, yeah, I'm a bit of a, I'm a centrist, right? I'm a, I'm, I'm, I've got a bit of left and right in me. Uh, there's no place for me on Twitter unless I completely embrace Jesus or transgenderism. <laughs> you yeah. know, it's just, it's just the way no it is. There's no way in between. Th- there's no in between. And going back to LinkedIn and where I'm going here is one of the reasons why I just love LinkedIn is LinkedIn, it's professional. It's about helping people. It's a real positive environment because I don't like toxicity. I don't like negativity. I try and start. I love everyone, right? I love everyone. And to me, LinkedIn gives you that platform to really help people, lift people up and really spread the love to everyone. And it's what you were saying about there's a certain level of professionalism and expectation. Um, And just so people are aware, you can indeed block people. Um, yes, and you can. can completely, A, disconnect from them, but also block people completely yes. in LinkedIn. So if you're finding that, it, in, like any social media platform, is there is some negativity, don't surround you and your business with that. Just Absolutely. rid them out of yeah. out of your social yeah. circle. The bit that's interesting, though, and I, was, I actually only clicked to this a week ago, and I think my wonderful wife asked me this one, is I have some days where I get sent at least 30,000 times a day uh, on LinkedIn, which is pretty good considering I used to be a homeless vet 10 years ago. Right? Not bad. Huh? Yeah, not, not bad. bad, not bad. Uh, homeless vet 10 years ago. But what the bit that's interesting, though, I almost never get trolled, right? And it's quite normal. Like, if I'm being seen, let's say at least 10,000 times a day, I'll just be conservative here. I almost never get trolled. But is that a LinkedIn thing because it's just not the platform where it happens? No. Or is it because everyone loves you and you're a connector and a but nice person? I think that's a point because I know people who get trolled a bit on LinkedIn, right? Now, here's the big difference. Whenever I put out content, I do, and I'm not perfect. I never ever will say I am So I'm definitely not going to make mistakes. But whenever I put out content, I'm trying to be as pure and noble as helpful. So whilst I may say the wrong word here and there, in my heart, I'm trying to be as positive and helpful as possible. And when you're acting from that frame, yeah, it's very hard to it's very hard to troll someone yeah. who's trying to help. And you're someone who is redonkulously connected. Yes. Do you come across in your feed, not from what you're posting or what people are reacting to your stuff, but do you come across much negativity? Ah, uh, yes, I do. Yes, I do. I see, actually see quite a bit of negativity. Uh, but from, is it a discussion? Is it an argument? Is it someone being intellectualising and trying to get the upper hand on a particular discussion? Or is it literally quite nasty? LinkedIn, you don't usually get the Twitterish type of trolling. Right. Right. Okay. You don't normally get that. It, on LinkedIn, and I was actually, one of my friends actually got trolled yesterday, right? On LinkedIn? Yeah, on LinkedIn. But on LinkedIn... What is that, no, but what does that look like? Tell me what, because yeah, honestly, I don't, I don't it's see more it. The inter, and it's more the intellectual sniping. Right, yes. Um, we're actually... So this is actually someone who tried, for example, this is very common LinkedIn trolling, right? Because, you know, saying on LinkedIn, you're a mean poo-poo head, it just, it's not very good trolling, right? That's yeah. more of something you say on Twitter. But on LinkedIn is... I had someone um, actually... This is common LinkedIn trolling, where I did a video on how to create a really good PowerPoint. Yep. And this person just tried to one-up me saying, oh, Ed, you're wrong, you're this and this and this. And then he tagged in one of his friends who then then dogpiled and then said, oh, yeah, Ed, you don't know what you're talking about, blah, 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 blah. So it wasn't so much, Ed, you're a mean poo-poo head. Mm. It was more like, well, Ed, you're just not as smart or as pure as we are and mm. we're, we're the enlightened PowerPoint gods that you're not. It was so, more like that. So isn't that expression trolling kind of like kids in the schoolyard who use the word bullying. It's funny because we literally had this discussion. I've got 12 and 13 year old girls and they're very quick to use yeah. that B word. They're very quick to say oh I got bullied. It's like well yeah. did you or did someone just call you a mean poo poo head or yeah. were they actually you know insist like in, in, yeah. insidiously maliciously nastily doing something and creating and you know yeah. whatever. Yeah. Were they actually bullying? So maybe what we need to do is change the conversation and say it's not actually trolling. Someone's just one up and shipping. 
and there's a difference because I don't think that's trolling. I've, I've, um, my, we had a, a bit of a okay. laugh, but my husband yeah. was a victim of trolling on Twitter. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Where else? Huh? Which we just laughed about it at the dinner table. So, your so your husband's a mean poo poo. He is a mean poo poo head, <laughs> but he didn't. It didn't have a great deal of effect on him. Um, it might have for someone else, but yes. I think there is there is that level of, of difference, and that you need to sort of yes, it should be called out, but. Um, but you just just leave it. <laughs> someone yeah, just well, someone just want to grandise then well, good well, o. What I tend to do and is that yeah, I suppose bullying. I think bullying's an overused word, right? And is trolling bullying? It can be, but can also may not be, right? Depends on context and intent. Yeah. A lot of factors there. Yeah. But I'll give you this answer though. I'll give you this answer though. In this case, I would argue it was trolling because I put out a video with my views on LinkedIn, and someone came in to give a differing point of view. Uh, that's just a differing point of view. But when he tagged in his friend to dogpile, mm. you're entering a dogpiling, mm. which is an internet tag, dogpiling. Is another definition of. Yeah, dogpiling is when you make a point with the intent of bringing other people in a back you and attack the target. It's called a dogpile, right? So this person was dogpiling, which is a form of trolling. And then I just deleted the comment, and then the person then basically said to me, oh, Ed, I noticed you deleted my comment. I said, yeah, look, I'm just not interested in that. And the person just left me alone. Yeah, yeah. And that's another way to handle it, of course, is to just either ignore, but if you notice that it is as... (laughs) Dogpiling. Yeah, it was dogpiling. Not an expression I use regularly. But if you notice that that's sort of happening, yeah. then you can, you've got yeah. control. And yeah. don't, don't forget that you yeah. do have control. And, and the thing is, just to make this point, I'm, I, I'm an old gamer from the 90s, right? I used to play LAN, Doom, death matches all the time. Doom. No one can. Contr- I lost a lot of hours to Doom. I'm actually a super, I'm actually an old ex troll. Like, I control better than anyone. I just choose not to. Yes. You know? Because now you're a nice person. I'm now a nice person. As opposed to the beginning of the program when you mentioned that you were not such a yeah, nice person. Yeah, yeah. I used to be the most epic, wonderful troll. and But I've, already, I've paid my dues for my previous transgressions. Clearly. Uh, but the thing is, yeah, no one can actually troll better than me. So I can spot a troll. For, because here's the point, and this is, the to me, what trolling is. Intent matters, right? So let's say I say something on social media that's a little bit dumb. And Alexi, you, who's a nice lady, you make a point disagreeing with me. Because I know your intent is pure, I would not consider that trolling. Mm. That's Alexi saying, look, Ed, you're a little bit wrong there. You shouldn't be saying stuff like that. I would actually take that seriously. Uh, That wouldn't be trolling. But if you're, not you, but if the person's acting from the frame of, I'm going to take Ed down a peg or I'm going to get my friends to attack him, that's actually trolling. So motive matters. Interesting. Well, look, that that was a very interesting philosophical yeah. discussion to round up today's show. Um, tell me how people can find out a little bit more about you and what it is that you do. Absolutely. Uh, what I encourage people is please add me on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm pretty easy to find. And also as well, if you're in Sydney, uh, go to Meetup and type in Profitable Marketing to see our regular events. And you're all welcome every time especially you attractive, awesome listeners out there. <laughs> Thanks, Edward. Now, if you've missed any of today's show, you can, of course, catch up via our smallbizmatters.com.au website where we have over 130 fantastic long-form business education podcasts. And let me tell you, everyone, we have yet to repeat a show. We have yet to repeat a topic. So thank you for uh, joining us today and talking all about your experience, your journey, your pulling up from your bootstraps, some of your marketing concepts and also your experience with LinkedIn, Edward. It's a pleasure. If I can just say this, everyone, I have to say my trademark. Everyone, I love your work. <laughs> and anyone who knows Edward on LinkedIn will have, uh, will have heard that numerous times. Thank you for joining us, everyone, here on Small Biz Matters on Triple H 100.1 FM. We'll be back next week with another excellent guest. You've been listening to Triple H 100.1 FM.